Um, so, I'm Carson Casey. I'm here on behalf of Vermont Queen Cities Coalition. Um, we're here housed here at the UVM Transportation Research Center for a Department of Energy program focused on reducing petroleum use in the transportation sector, um, which is why we've co-hosted or, you know, are supporting this event with um, METAL, whose mission is to reduce, um, reduce emissions and advanced marine diesel engines. So um, we're here. I guess I'd like to introduce Dr. Lisa Alman Hall, who's going to um, introduce our speaker today. Uh, Dr. Richard. Thanks very much, Carson. So uh, it is always my pleasure to introduce a fellow UTC director. <laughs> and uh, we met Richard Kimball uh, when Susan Handy held sort of an all sustainability focused UTCs meeting at TRB this past January. And uh, he is a specialist in marine propulsion, propellers, turbines, but is setting up this new lab. And uh, the uh, Marine Maritime Academy received a UTC under the new competition. And uh, so he's been funded by the NSF and the Department of Energy, but now, like us, also the, the USDOT holds a PhD from MIT. And uh, we're really looking forward to hearing all about everything uh, you guys okay. are doing because it's, it's not stuff we do, but it's so close to what we do that yeah, we have a lot of interest. Interesting. There's thank you for driving there. on this. Oh, thank you. It's a beautiful city. It's the first time we've been to, well, I guess my wife has been to Berlin before, but I never have. So, so we got to walk around town. This morning. So, nice, sustainable city, isn't it? We or like getting, to think so. <laughs> <laughs> So thank you, Lisa. Uh, as as I said, I'm Rich, Dr. Richard Kimball from Maine. Dr. Richard Kimball, the fugitive. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm hiding at Ancastian, Maine. Um, uh, a little bit about, and we did get a UTC a tier one, I guess. So that's the, the smaller one, but less onerous, I guess. Um, and from the Department of Transportation. Um, it turns out the Department of Transportation is very integral to our school, even though we get very little uh, funding outside of MARAD, which is a which is a uh, DOT agency. So this is the first time we've been able to get research funding um, through that uh, agency. A little bit about Maine Maritime Academy to start. Uh, we were founded in 1942 because a lot of merchant marine ships were being sunk by German U-boats and they were running out of mariners. And so they quickly founded this school and some others. but to train merchant marines to run ships during the war and um, and the like. So so it was out of that need that this school was formed. In Castine, they started out with, I think, 30 students. We're up to a, a little under 1,000 students now. And it's becoming more and more competitive, um, mainly because of the kind of career-oriented nature of the school. I think whenever there's tough times, I think that we, we tend to not have trouble finding people who want to get into our industry since the, the, the job prospects are very good. Uh, we're uh, primarily a transportation school. Um, this is, I was talking earlier uh, about one of our issues is on workforce development when we were writing this grant. I was like, well, I don't know how we can do any more than we already do for <laughs> workforce development. So it was kind of like trying to invent things to, to put into the the grant. But we're coming up with some ideas, and I think we've got some ideas already. Um, 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 to hands-on school, it was it's actually transitioned. All the maritime academies have transitioned from kind of trade schools. They still have that reputation of being trade schools. They they were probably 30 years ago, the trade schools. Uh, they've actually transitioned to a college level um, schools now. So the degree actually is fairly rigorous. Um, and but that's been a stigma that's 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 uh, kind of stuck with us since we're an academy and not a college. There are six uh, maritime uh, state maritime schools in the country: Massachusetts, uh, Texas, uh, New York, California, uh, Great Lakes, and ourselves. And uh, and then there are three service academies, which are similar in their 
uh, what they do, the, the, the Naval Academy, Coast Guard Academy, and the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. So those nine institutions train most of the mariners, the off mariner officers in the country. So, so it's a very small group, and they're all fairly small schools, they're all about roughly our size, a little bit bigger. So, so it's a very tight-knit um, little family that we have. Uh, and because it's a small, it's a big industry with a small number of people, the maritime industry has a very few people in it. So that means that we're very well connected with the top levels of our industry because it's very easy to be in contact with. Um, there's not very many of us. So. And then the academy itself, we have our uniqueness is we're a waterfront academy. We have a lot of infrastructure. So that's not typical of a college. Um, those 950 grads, graduate students and undergrads? Or we are uh, primarily undergraduate. We only have one master's program in business and logistics. It produces maybe, they probably have about 50 students in there. So it's from primarily undergraduate institution. So our graduate uh, students come from the University of Maine. That's how we deal with that. And they're only about an hour away from us, so it's fairly close. Um, so our UTC, it was um, under under the um, sustainability um, track, and so and we're focused on, um, as Carson said, on reducing emissions in marine diesel engines, essentially. Our, uh, and then a little blurb about, like, of course, workforce development and all the other good things that we need to do. Essentially, so, and I'll talk more about that. That compelling need later because for us in our industry that particular issue of emissions reduction is 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 not just an academic exercise it's actually uh, an extraordinarily onerous reality for our industry right now so so it's really driving um, a, a lot of uh, activity anxiety and and, uh, and and the like a little bit about our school here's a shot of our waterfront so you can get an idea of what we have um, so this this vessel right here, well, this vessel right here, this is our um, tall ship. So this is about uh, 90 feet, so just to give you a scale. And uh, this is our training ship. This is a 500-foot training vessel, ocean-going tra training vessel. We have tugboats. We have all kinds of work boats. We have water well, waterfront work bay, bays, all kinds of infrastructure for uh, diesel engine lab, uh, labs and things like that. So we can move big heavy things around in the ocean, move them around. We also have a large barge and other things that we push around. A lot of things that we keep uh, moored off the off the docks here. Uh, so we have a lot of big infrastructure. Um, and this ship, by the way, is owned by the DOT. This is owned by MERAD, which is um, not many people know. MERAD is a DOT organization. Um, not uh, too well remembered within DOT, but it is there. <laughs> they don't have any money, but they do have they do have ships, so, so. and they and they um, they pay our crew actually, so, so and for the maintenance of the ship, and we just are basically contracted, and we use this to train our mariners in how to run vessels as part of the Coast Guard licensing process. About sixty percent of our students are in uniform. Uh, they're in a regiment. They're not in the military, but they're in a regimented program. I think Norwich University here is similar to that, if you know anything about that. Um, and it's required to get a Coast Guard license. You have to be in a regimented program. So a lot of them do it because they have to. So they have to have some kind of military style structure. Uh, so that makes the, the, all of the maritime candidates a little bit unique in, in the way they, uh, you know, in the college atmosphere is a little different. Most college students don't march around campus <laughs> say, yes, sir, no, sir. <laughs> um, this is the Coast Guard 41 vessel I'll talk a little bit about later. This is our main research vessel for this grant right now. We're instrumenting this to be our little our emissions laboratory. And I know that I saw that you have a, a car someplace that you've done that with, and so it's kind of the equivalent for it. Um, what we're doing here. This is our tugboat. It's an ocean-going rated tug. Um, you know, regular engine stands, and then we have what I call real engines. These are. This is a locomotive engine right here. So in our labs, and 
this is a diesel gen set that would be of the style that would be on the training kit. So you work on two stroke, and four stroke. Yeah, two stroke, four stroke. Um, what we don't have, and I'd like to get, is a slow speed. Uh, and we'd be the only um, independent lab in the world that have one if we had that. But slow speed are these ones that you know, I don't know if you've ever seen them. They're like two stories high. You know, people can stand inside the cylinders. They're huge. Yeah. Um, they go about 90 RPM maximum speed. So, so tankers use those. We started our research efforts in 2004. That's when I arrived, actually. Um, and uh, there wasn't a lot of activity in, the, in any of the maritime academies until about that time. And we really started focusing on ocean energy. Uh, that was our big time area. So tidal energy up in Maine, that's a big deal. It's a lot of tidal energy. Um, and this is our energy, this is the tidal energy, this is our bars that we use for testing devices. A um, little bit with the wave energy, not a lot. Um, we're involved with UMAIN on their offshore wind energy. Floating offshore wind, this is actually a prototype that's sitting off Castine right now. Um, testing offshore wind um, systems, floating offshore wind systems, which is a very, very large, potentially very large renewable energy source that's untapped at this moment. So that can be potentially in the hundreds of gigawatt level, which the national need is 600 gigawatts. So we're talking about a resource that's on the scale of the national uh, electrical grid need. So it's a very, very um, compelling one. And then we just formed the, this lab, Marine Engine Testing and Emissions Laboratory. So that's what it stands for. We for formed that just before this. We got this UTC grant, and we've been working on a couple of projects. Some background on the um, on the uh, emissions issue. Um, what happened recently, or a few years ago, the International Maritime Organization took jurisdiction over the emissions regulations for shipping worldwide. Okay, so the nations agreed that the IMO would set the rules, and this was transformational for the entire uh, world shipping industry. Prior to that, it was country by country. There were no real regulations. Every time they tried to implement any emissions regulations offshore, um, this nation would say yes, this nation would say no, and it would just fall apart. Okay, so, and the the shipping industry kind of played that off as long as they could. So they always got a pass on emissions. So they are the dirtiest industry right now. Um, power plants can't get away with that. Rail can't get away with that. All the other industries have been cleaned up. Maybe, maybe your backyard charcoal grill may be worse, but but, um, but they're, they've been given a pass, but no more. Um, this regulation, MARPOL Annex 6, is um, the infamous regulation that has regulated um, um, emissions worldwide for shipping. Uh, they've also designated, the nations have designated areas called the uh, emission control areas. These are within 200 miles of the coastline. Uh, and all inland waterways, so that includes all the Great Lakes, all the inland waterways on the coast, the Mississippi River Valley, pretty much most of the shipping that happens in the United States. Yes? When you say countries in the world, how many countries are you really talking about? Are I, there significant holdouts? I don't think there are, there, it, there are no holdouts. There may be people who are skirting the regulations, uh, but this is akin, akin to the United Nations level organization. So it is supposed to be, like for example, piracy is also governed by IMO. Um, most nations abide by the international rules for how you treat pirates. You know, if a pirate takes your ship 300 miles offshore, what do they do? Where does it go? That, that's all governed by IMO. So, so it's, it's pretty, it's got a lot of teeth. Okay. It, this has been, since they took over emissions, it's been hard for nations to get around this. But the industry is expected that the politicians are going to somehow figure out how to cave on these. And what that's meant is nobody's really done anything to lead up to these, um, these emissions. So you can see the emissions levels, this is just NOx. It starts out, tier one, this is like, put a new filter in your engine and you'll be okay. This one is like, I put a new filter and clean, you know, clean the injectors. This is like new technologies. So this is where we're at now. So this is like putting on emissions controls like scrubbers, um, sele uh, uh, selective catalyst reduction for NOx reduction. These are particulate filters, things like that. 
uh, are required here. And T4, tier four is again uh, deeper. And these tiers, there's tiers that are like this for rail and, and other surface industries. They're not the same tiers, but it's the same type of program. So. Sorry, what does the little n mean in, le in less than one? Um, this means, uh, I think that means the, uh, the, the, the size of the engine in kilowatts, I believe. So if you're talking under 2,000 kilowatts, you know, uh, engine. So there, there are different regulations for different size engines. Just an example, and they have, they have them for socks and uh, particulates as well. It's the same kind of thing. So, well, this is hard to read, but I'm going to go through each one, so I won't, won't really need it. I'll just give you the highlights. So we have in our DOT program, we have now six identified projects. One is a glycerin, di uh, glycerin diesel fuel emulsion technology we're developing. Uh, the other one is, and this one is one that I hope to have some more discussion on, uh, a bridge continuous emissions monitoring system. So this is like in-vessel emissions monitoring, which as some of you know, is not as easy as it sounds. Right? But, uh, but that's something that we see uh, our industry may be going towards and may be forced to go to, actually. Um, hydrogen injection is another technology we're looking at. Um, we have another project with the University of Maine. They have a big forest biomass research institute. And so they're developing diesel derivatives from biomass. So we're going to test them in our marine diesel. So that's just um, um, they're leading this one. We also have a thermoelectric exhaust generator system that's recovering heat from the exhaust, turning it directly into electricity. So this is an efficiency improvement, not necessarily an emissions reduction. Okay. Uh, there's been some talk of using this to drive a diesel particulate filter. So then so it would to be, regenerate it? Yeah, to use the electricity to, to burn off the, the soot. And then, and then this last one is my favorite because it's kind of um, below the radar right now. And this is one of those. There's almost no hope of going anywhere, but if it does, it's going to be really big. It's a, it's a glycerin from algae project. So this is also one I can attract a lot of students on because it's pretty cool. Um, but we're making glycerin from algae. And, and people don't even know why we want glycerin, glycerin, you know, except for hand cream. But, uh, but we need it for this. It's actually, it's actually a good fuel, so, or can be. So the first project is this diesel glycerin emulsion. I don't know if anybody have heard of water diesel emulsions, where they take water and put it into diesel fuel and get that to, to stay together, inject it into the cylinder, and the NOx goes down you know, by, I don't know, 60, 70, 80 percent, something like can be. Um, that's fairly well known, um, and it's starting to become, in our world, it's starting to actually become potentially mainstream technology, the water diesel emulsion. Um, large engine manufacturers are currently are certifying engines for water diesel emulsion as, as, a, as a emissions reduction technique. So that's on the horizon. If you add glycerin, it has the same effect as water in the combustion sense, but it has fuel content. So, so it burns. It's actually a valuable fuel. It's actually, uh, it's actually produced by the biodiesel industry. When you make biodiesel, you get a 10% of the biodiesel becomes waste glycerin, approximately. And so there's a large glut of this fuel on the market with no place to use it. So it is a zero net carbon because it is a, it is a biofuel and it's extremely low cost, which is what we like in the marine industry. It's actually cheaper per kilowatt hour than, than Bunker C, which is the... Bunker C is essentially one step above asphalt. <laughs> so, if, it's, if there's any worse, it would be solid. So, yeah. uh, and it is most of the time they have to heat it to keep to, even to burn it. So, um, so um, some of the advantages, other advantages, the oxygen that's in the fuel, it's an alcohol-like thing. Yes, uh, I was under the assumption that uh, the water emulsion reduced NOx because it reduced, uh, and this might be too technical. Sorry. Uh, it reduced uh, the flame temperature. Flame temperature does, yeah. So if that's a fuel, mm -hmm. it, it's going to reduce. It might reduce flame, flame temperature to some extent, but mm -hmm. probably not as much as water. Right? Yeah, but um, reducing flame temperature is a is a double edged sword, right? Right. Because it's also reducing your efficiency. Right. Because you're you're having to flash the the water. 
it, it turns out that the oxygen, yeah, and, and it's got to do with the emulsion okay. chemistry when you inject it, how that actually initiates combustion. It gives you better distributed in combustion. It's almost like it's, it's pre-misted within the fuel. Um, but it has the same, same effect as, as, uh, as water on actually reducing the emissions. And I'll show you some data. So, um, it's also, um, glycerin's not only is it cheap, it's very, it has high lubricity. Right? So it, it actually is something that mariners really care about. They care about, they don't like water in their diesel. If you say water in diesel to any mariner, that's, those don't mix, right? But, so, um, so it does have that, it has some of those um, um, capabilities. So basically there's two things, lower emission and lower cost. If you can do that and really do it, that's a winner in the marine industry because it's a very cost-driven industry. This is just some data of running small, a small diesel with the glycerin emulsion versus conventional diesel. This is conventional diesel here, and this is NOx and particulates. And you can see here versus power, you can see that the NOx reduction and the particulate reduction uh, tracks as we'd expect. And, uh, what so, size particles? So that's a question that needs to be answered. In fact, uh, that's part of the, yeah, part of the, uh, I'm sure. These guys love that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that seems to be, um, that seems to be a trend now is like, well, we don't care, we should care more about the size of the particles than we do the number of particles because these really tiny ones really can do a lot of damage to your tissues and they can go through your tissues. So, so yeah, that's getting the particle distributions is going to be important. Right now it's not regulated on size. So, so as far as the manner is concerned, I don't care as long as it's below the EPA regulation. Or the Marple well, the industry. Yeah, yeah industry but but I mean, as researchers, our our job is to right. kind of say, well, let's let's figure out what really is going on. Here. So, so I'm curious about why the engine is running 900 rpm in these tests. Hmm. Is that a typical operating point for a diesel engine? Um, no, this is run on Oak Ridge National Labs um, single engine diesel test stand. I believe this is at the power level that we designated for our labs. I'm not really sure. Um, it was. It's like a tiny engine. Well, usually they would run higher. They would run 1,800 to 3,600. It's a small engine. It's a very small engine. It's like a one cylinder. Yeah. yeah. This one down here, this was run at about 3,000 RPM, this data right here. So this is on our little stand here. This is certifiable. This is just our little playing around data. You know, I wouldn't publish this data uh, here, but this, this, um, this was done at Oak Ridge. So. Did you say what the, uh, how much glycerin is, is in this? Um, we vary it between, um, well, we've gone from 10 to 90 percent, but typically around 30 percent, uh, 30 to 50 percent. So pretty heavy. Yeah. Yeah, pretty heavy. Not just uh, an additive. You know, yeah. More, more, more than, the water emulsions are running around 10 percent. Mm -hmm. You start going up, and then you start hitting the efficiency of the engine if you put more than 10% water. And the emulsion is stable. I'm assuming more stable for the glycerin. Um, well, that's one of the tricks that the company is working on. Is, but yeah, it is. It can be made stable. You know, like the trick is to make this a drop-in fuel that can be stable for a year, right. or something, and be able to get thermal cycling and all those other things. So that's part of the part of the trick. That's not easy to do, but you don't have a giant mixer. Right, we could we could have a big you know, in there, very, keeping our vinegar and oil. And the first the first project yeah, the first project we did with the students was that I had just did this as a, a seed project, and I said I said I just just make it stay together for thirty seconds, so that we can get through an injector, right? Yeah. And that was a trick. And then we've gone to thirty seconds to days to weeks to now years. So so that's um, that's proven making progress. Second project here is um, this continuous emissions monitoring system on board a work vessel, on board any vessel actually. Um, so uh, right now we're putting this on our quick water, the boat I showed you before. Uh, it has, it's not in place yet, but we're working on it. So we're using, and I, I actually went through your website a couple days ago, I realized you're using the same 
the same FDIR. So it was like I gave my engineer a pat on the back. It's okay. It looks like you're going in the right direction. <laughs> um, but we're, we're looking at this system. We're looking at a, a, a particulate measurement system, BMI, as well. And then uh, instrumenting uh, all this to be able to be on the bridge so that the captain and the students can see it all in real time. And also, uh, we want to be able to, once we can put it on a computer here, going wireless is going to be, it's not really easy because when you do wireless at sea, you have different things that you need to happen. It's not like cell phones anymore, but, but that will be the obvious thing is to have the DOT program managers be able to log in and see this stuff going. Is the idea that they, it affects their behavior and they can yeah. sort of see when... Yeah, that's the idea on, on one of our, um, kind of our uh, education and workforce part of our, our educational um, um, thrust has been the, the environmental side yeah. to address that. And this is, we see this as very practical because we see this as something that the, the captains can actually yeah. um, use. Because right now they actually have transitioned from just getting from point A to B to um, doing weather planning for how to get there efficiently, and they're doing fuel efficiency monitoring now. So there are programs that say, this is the most effective route for you to get from here to here under these weather conditions and save fuel. That's, that's one of the things in there. So as the regulations come on board, emissions uh, output is also going to be something. So, so this is just looking ahead at that and, and trying to develop systems so that and we really want to see if they can do this as part of our project. It's, does it make any difference for them to know? Can they reduce it by having knowledge? So, so what is the fuel that's used in this smaller vessel? I think you call it the quick water vessel? It's a conventional diesel. It is like a number three diesel? Yeah. Um, yeah, low sulfur diesel is what we're using now. And low sulfur or ultra low? No, we just use so low sulfur right now. 500 ppm? Yeah. So we may use ultra low eventually, cause, but, but right now we're just using <clears throat> low sulfur. So here's our vessels. This is the one we're setting up. It's a 41. A lot of a lot of colleges can have a boat like this. Like if you have a marine biology program, you might have a boat like this to service your uh, you know your work. Um, this is our tugboat and our ship. This is actually the tugboat right here, so you can see how big the ship is. So it's and this <clears throat> this has twin Cummins um, 300 horsepower V8s in it. The twin engine is really important for our research because, and we're going to have the ability to switch fuels. So we can do direct side by side comparison, and we can switch between fuels underway. So it'll take out the bias between engines. You know, so as we're going, we can do test fuel A compared to diesel and switch it over to the yeah. engines. Yeah, and then be able to say, no, it's not an engine thing, it's right. it's actually something. Yeah. So that's really kind of an important feature of this particular vessel. How did these are these vessels like somewhat representative of yeah. the types of that, the types of things that like your students yeah. encounter? In yeah, this is this lives? is representative of a, of a typical um, you know hundred ton work work boat right. would have these kind of engine. This is typical of the tug, tug and barge, boat. and it's typical of blue water ocean. Vessels. What is that? That's our training ship. But I mean, what? Blue water, water just means like uh, ocean-going, large shipping vessels, like okay. a tanker. Okay. Or, okay. Um, you know, uh, row rows. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Offshore, whatever. So, so those. That's right. And so, so the engine in here is a medium-speed diesel, 5,000 horsepower, uh, with three medium-speed MAK gen sets. That's typical. No, two is usually typical. This has basically a um, large uh, well, Detroit diesel, two strokes. Um, they're like uh, rail engines. Um, and then this is more conventional, um, high speed diesel, um, uh, four stroke. And we, we, we plan on putting these this system on each one of these vessels eventually because they represent different classes. And so. So you can imagine that a tugboat operator logging a mission is going to be a different situation <laughs> than somebody on an ocean-going vessel. So, in fact, they may be the more critical one yeah. because of the load variation that they have and things like that. So, so here's the quick water. We're setting it up. I just I'll talk. I don't need to talk much about this. 
uh, what we're doing, the rapid fuel switchover, here's this, here's it, we're being, it's being built right now with all the switchover valves and things like that. And also, um, instrumenting it for, um, for all real-time performance measurement, obviously in addition to the emissions, we want to know how much torque output, what the RPM output, the, what, the, you know, what the air flow is, what the exhaust flow is, what the temperatures are, all that stuff is also going to be added so that it's collected in real time with the emissions data so that we can see exactly what the performance uh, is as we go underway. And they're all different instruments by different manufacturers. And yeah. You're going to have to get them to talk to each other. <laughs> yeah, usually it's the bigger ones that give us the trouble, like the MTS, yeah. where they have their proprietary software. Right. Yeah. Uh, I hate that word, proprietary software. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, the hydrogen injection system, that's like a system we're buying off a manufacturer that makes this. He's got great claims that this does wonderful things. Yeah, there's several companies that make these. This is one that makes it for marine. Uh, we, we're hoping that this one's a little more serious than some of the others, but what happens here is they basically have a, um, a uh, hydrogen generation system here, uh, some kind of membrane system. You pump in electricity, you get out hydrogen and oxygen. It pumps the, um, the hydrogen into the fuel. They actually, on this one, it goes into the fuel, not into the air intake, and and then is is put into the injection and then run through the engine. And we're going to see if that works. We don't know whether this is going to work or not. The claims of this guy and the data he's got looks great, but there's nobody in the industry who's really taking this technology seriously. So we'll see if it works. And you know, we're able to be an independent third party evaluator, and you know, we don't have a stake in the game with this thing. So if it works, it does. And we have a reputation. So so that's that's really what we're doing now. But both of these uh, technologies are, are intake side, emissions reduction technology. Most of the conventional, uh, the way the way the industry is going is on the exhaust side. So scrubbers is the catch-all term, but that includes this silicon, uh, the, the selective catalyst reduction and diesel particulate filters. Those are all on the exhaust side. And that's where the engine manufacturers are going. When they say tier four compliant, a lot of saying you need an SCR. And the mariners that are using these systems now absolutely hate them. They, they are high maintenance, they're dirty, they reduce the performance of the engine, they increase fuel consumption. So there's a lot of reasons why uh, the mariners don't, don't really like it. Uh, the, this fourth project is the UMaine project. They have a huge center that's dedicated to this. This is actually a paper mill in Old Town, Maine, and part of that paper mill is dedicated to this biomass research center. And they're basically taking, well, they don't like it when I say making trees into diesel because it's like it's any biomass, <laughs> so, uh, but crude biomass into diesel, and they have a couple processes that do that. There's one is this pyrolysis. Um, uh, formate pyrolysis thing, FASP, um, that they use to make diesel. And then they have another process, uh, thermal deoxygenization. Um, and both of those processes produce eventually uh, a crude bio, uh, bio crude, I guess you'd call it. And then that can be fractionated into different distillates, uh, including diesel. And so, so those, they're working on giving us Samples of those. This lab is in the research. They give you a liter, and that's like a month's production. And then we burn it in like five minutes. And then, um, but that's that's the level of that research. Can we make this fuel into a, into a, a viable transportation fuel? So they're going to make all this stuff. We're going to test it in our engines, and uh, and our, our small engines. We only, we only have a liter, so we can't burn it in the big. <laughs> can't even start the engine on the liter. <laughs> So, um, so this is the yeah this is just the, the <clears throat> what we're going to do there. I've already talked about that. Uh, the last the fifth project is this thermoelectric exhaust generator. We've been working on this for many many years. It's kind of a very far out there project because the technology really isn't quite there yet to make this viable. Uh, but we're really just setting up to. Uh, Actually, what we're really setting up to do is to t show the industry why it's not viable. That's actually what we're really doing now. Uh, and there's been a lot of advance in thermoelectric materials. You know, a, therm a thermocouple is a thermoelectric material. Uh, it's, uh, it's two dissimilar metals or dissimilar materials.
materials, um, they're mostly ceramics now, that are hooked in a way that if you have a heat source, uh, if you have a heat difference between the two sides, you can get a voltage output and, gen and power generation. So um, these little beer coolers that you get are thermoelectric devices. Um, the key current parameter here is this, this, um, this figure of merit Z, ZT sometimes called, <clears throat> which is uh, related to the CBET coefficient, which is related to the amount of volts this thing puts out for a given temperature um, difference. The, thermal, the electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity kind of tells you how efficient the material is. If this number is big, it's really good. So uh, a ZT of 2 is really great. A ZT of 5 is amazing. So if we, if we can get to 2, that would be great. If we can get to 5, then you might see them replace internal combustion engines. Yeah. So that's kind of the range. They were a long way from that. So uh, they've been able to show these kind of ZTs in laboratory experiments, carefully controlled. When they go to put it into any kind of real system, there's been a lack of demonstration. So, and, and that's one of our goals, is to actually make practical heat recovery systems and show what they can do under real conditions. And what we've found now is one of the biggest problems with these materials is they're just not matched to the to the heat transfer of the actual system that we have. So, you know, you need to get, you know, one kilowatt per, you know, square centimeter through, and you can only get 100 watts per square centimeter through from a diesel exhaust. So they're just mismatched. Uh, even so, they're not that efficient, but this makes it even worse. So. So now they're talk, we, we're, we're talking about um, systems. This here is a system that was actually put onto a semi tractor trailer that was sent to us. That's a, I believe that's a 250, no, 500 watt generator. It's the size of a diesel stack. So 500 watts out of diesel engine, that's all they get. So, and it's all limited on, it basically it's limited by the heat transfer. To do that, they had to actually increase the heat transfer rate. And if you look inside, they put this big ball inside of it. They made the exhaust passage like this big. And then they put about a 1,000 fins on it. So actually, the, the back pressure from this system, if you just calculate using fluid dynamics, pressure drop times flow rate, the back pressure, it's like a kilowatt. So, so you just lost. A, you just lost more than a kilowatt in your engine performance to produce 500 watts of electrical power. It's, it's not, you know, that's not viable. So that's what, what we're working on is how to, how, to, how to make that a better match and how to make a platform that can actually tell whether these technologies are actually going to be viable. So this is just a device to characterize the outputs of these things. This is our little exhaust. Um, exhaust simulator system. So we have here a plate that we can move up and down so we can bury this gap here. Thermoelectric devices here. And then we can measure the pressure drop, the flow rate, and then we can measure the actual output so we can we can plot both the losses versus the gains in a real situation. And, uh, and this actually we can put onto our real quick water or onto our engine stands. Um, so that's what we're going with that. And the last project, this is the last slide actually. Um, this is my favorite. Um, so glycerin fuel from algae. So in the 70s, there was discovered this algae that magically produces glycerin, uh, a significant amount of glycerin. I think all algae produces a little bit. But this particular algae, um, this particular algae, and there's a couple of other types, but this one here, produces about 80% of its body weight in glycerin up to that. So this is a very, very... Um, so it's a lot of it's a lot of fuel for one animal to produce, um, and it also has been shown to excrete it, which is very compelling to us because now it says that not only can we make the glycerin with the organism, but we don't have to macerate the organism to get the fuel out. We can just have it continually produce it. So that's actually quite attractive from a farming standpoint to be able to continually produce the fuel, uh, converting solar energy into a liquid fuel. Uh, and then, and then the, now the reason this stuff exists is because it, it grows in Arctic and high salinity environments. So this grows in, in salt swamps in the Middle East and in northern Norway. So um, two completely disparate ecosystems. 
and they exist in both places. Uh, I think we think that the reason is this: in a high salinity environment, they need to they need to change their osmotic pressure to keep the salt from intruding, and by putting glycerin in with the water that they have, uh, changes that osmotic pressure. That's what's been reported. In Arctic environment, if you put a little bit of water in glycerin, it's antifreeze. So, so we I mean we're just postulating that that's the reason why. Is needed to keep the organism from freezing in the Arctic environment and to keep the salt out of it in the high salinity environment. So that's very important because now I have a, a control here because what happens if the salinity goes down? Does it excrete just glycerin when the salinity goes down? And, you know, how can we maximize production of the glycerin? That's what we're studying now. And we're really, this is our little bioreactor here that we're producing the glycerin in and we're at kind of laboratory scale. Um, but the one thing that I've noticed with this project is the people who grow algae, the, the phycologists, this that's the term for a person who studies algae, and an engineer could speak two completely different languages, might as well be on different planets. Right? Well, I read these papers and they talk in you know it talks in terms of <coughs> organisms per liter. And I'm like, well, how many kilowatts per square meter does that you know translate into? So what we're trying to do is I have a bunch of marine biology students working on this with the engineers so that we can translate between the biological side of things into kind of the the engineering and the economic and kind of keep that get that language made. Uh, there's a lot of things we need to do. We need to figure out how to measure the glycerin that's in there and, and we're focused on really a farm scale type of system, not a laboratory scale, but something that a farmer could have a little sensor and say, okay, I've got 10% glycerin in my solutions, time to get it out of solution, harvest it. Uh, what kind of media should you grow it in? What is the carbon energy capture efficiency? This is something that I've gotten very little information on from the literature. And, and it seems that people aren't thinking in terms of this. It's like, how much carbon can this stuff absorb? What is what is the rate at which you can absorb carbon from from an algae pond? And if you think of it, I think of it in terms of a farm or a pond. I have a surface area. I have air that has carbon in it. How am I getting that into there? Is that limiting my production or is it energy? That's a question that I haven't been able to find the answer. And what limits the growth of this? And that, I think that's part of that. And then, I um, can't see it here, but, uh, and then that leads to farm output and efficiency, the economics and all that stuff. So this is um, this is the potential for this is the glycerin economy, right? If you can make uh, uh, so, just to back up, algae fuel has been reported to be able to produce, and I'm not going to claim that this number is accurate, but it's, it's out there everywhere. Five thousand gallons an acre of biodiesel. Okay, somebody somewhere did something that said, that, and that's the number that goes out there. Corn oil is two hundred gallons an acre, so. We're talking order of magnitude more per acre, much, much more economically viable. Um, I believe that study was done by pumping carbon out of a like coal plant or seeding the carbon. So that may be a limiting factor to that number. But the, the potential is really there to make this a very efficient way to produce liquid fuel from the sun. And there are not very many easy ways to do that. So. Uh, and glycerin is a very, very good chemical for, you can burn it, but you can also make other fuels from this. It's a good feedstock for making derivatives or other things from plastics or fuels. So, so if this can produce that kind of rate, then it can be very, very viable. As a, and it, you don't have to macerate the, the algae. Currently now they have to harvest it, they squeeze all the oil out of it, and they start over again. So if this excretes it, then that could be an so that's that's my talk. Question. So do you do your own in-house fuel analyses or do you sort of farm those out to a commercial or maybe University of Maine does that? University of Maine does a lot of our um, fuel analysis. We do only um, rudimentary stuff in-house. We have a little mini chem chemical lab. Um, but right now, we haven't set that up to 
to, to, to do that in any kind of certifiable way. So, so yeah, we'll send it out to commercial places. It's actually pretty cheap um, to do. It's kind of hard for me to say that we need to develop that in-house, but it's always nice to have the ability yes, to do yes. the research. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I, I want to have the capability because I think as a researcher, you need to be able to do more than just the standard testing. Uh, but no, right now, we're most of it we're doing out. All the fuel uh, formulations we're doing in-house. So we built, we make the fuels, we actually emulsify them, we're working on the emulsion technologies. That right now is more of a focus for us because it's, it's, uh, it's the critical technology that allows it to be enabled and without, and whereas the analysis is already something that somebody can do. So, so I'm just, we're just kind of focusing on the area that we have. Um, you know, we only have so many people. So that's, that's, I'm wondering also about the fuels, whether you thought about their stability, oxidative stability over time. Yeah, well, that's actually been very, very critical. Uh, um, and we have, that's one of the studies that we do. We do, we have several studies. We have thermal cycling studies that we're doing on the fuel after we emulsify it. Uh, we actually run them through to get particle sizing over time, settling rates, things like that. So that we can see if it's you know, if it's if it's coagulating or, you know, if it's uh, if it's actually uh, stable. Um, the <coughs> uh, oxygen degradation we haven't seen much of that, but we've been testing on the scale of like a year. Um, we don't really foresee this fuel right now being needing to be any much longer than that for the type of people that we're targeting. These are sophisticated fuel users. We are not. Um, we actually gave some fuel to a fellow who had a tour boat uh, down in Portland, and it was a disaster because everything we told him not to do with the fuel, he immediately did it. <laughs> he said, "Don't put this in a, in, a, in an automotive vehicle." He puts it in his truck. You know? <laughs> I drove to Vermont the other day. It worked fine. You know? But then when I came back, it's blowing smoke. I was like, "What color was the smoke?" You know. <laughs> One of the problems with this biodiesel, it was a biodiesel derivative too, it mixed it with biodiesel, is uh, there's been some data to show that it, it's kind of a detergent in some sense. It, it actually tends tend to collect the, the crud. So when you first put it in, and we saw that in this case, it kind of collected with all the crud in his tank and that got into his filters and he was having trouble, um, he was having trouble with his filters because his tanks were dirty and this stuff was just kind of, you know, collecting it all. And you know, if he'd run it for, a year or he hadn't let it settle, it would have been a problem. But, but, um, but the users that we're targeting, they're, they're, they have fuel engineers on board. I mean, a, a, a marine engineer, and one of their jobs is to test the fuel, to you know maintain the quality of the fuel. They understand how to run the fuel. They have instructions. So uh, when they buy the fuel, they actually check the specs. Um, so they're more sophisticated users, and that's what we're targeting. For the marine world and even the rail world, they're, they're, they're more sophisticated, and so some of these issues um, that you might see if you were to if you were to put it at a pump at a gas station, you know there'd be issues there that you know you wouldn't want to have uh, a general consumer putting it in and not knowing what happened when they can't start their car. Other questions? A question about the. The UTC and how you, what, what a typical project team looks like. Do you have people from partners usually from UMaine and, and from MMA, and then is all your research graduate students, or do you have to do undergrads to get them involved? Well, as well? Most of my uh, undergrads are heavily involved. Maine Maritime only has undergrads where they right. available, so uh, it's actually mostly undergrads and um, research engineers. So you have staff. I have staff. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then a few grad students um, working on it. Um, you know, that's one of our limitations is uh, the number of grad students. Right. And uh, I mean, I'm working with, now we're expanding into Australia, for example. Navy actually fuels out of Brisbane, the U.S. Navy. And so there's, there's U.S. money to collaborate with uh, Australia to work on the, you know, fuel source stability in, uh, this is military stability in that region. 
-hmm. And so, um, you know, we're, we may be getting grad students from those places. But I have to import grad students from different places. So. Right. The other thing I should say is, I mean, another time, we're, you know, we're very young to research, we're a very small institution. We've only survived in doing research, and, and basically as of uh, about a year ago, I, I was the, off, the Office of Sponsored Programs at Maine Maritime Academy, <laughs> and the lead PI on all the research projects at Maine Maritime. So, so it was a, it, it's a small institution, and it's learning how to grow into this. Yeah. research role, whereas a lot of institutions have a history with it, so there's some infrastructure. So that's been one of my issues. But on the other hand, I've had no research from our school, so what that's made me do is learn how to learn how to get my own money. Yeah. Uh, I don't have a nickel from the school to do anything. Yeah. And so that's caused us to be very thrifty and very, very, uh, very, very good at planning how we use our money. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, um, it's forced us also, the only way we've been able to survive is through collaboration. Yeah. Um, we have to collaborate. We're too small to really be. This is an anomaly. The UTC is an anomaly. Um, so um, normally we would be collaborating with others. And I found it extremely easy to collaborate. If anybody needs a maritime piece to the proposal, the infrastructure and experience that we have, it makes it really easy for somebody to say, can we collaborate with you because we need this, yeah. this area, and that's been very successful. So. Yeah. So. But the, this UTC has been, um, it's completely changed. It's actually, this UTC I think might end up changing all of the maritime schools because all the maritime schools are in the same boat. Um, they're just starting to get into research. They're not used to running centers. There's been some work done at the Great Lakes. Um, they've been putting some Navy biodiesel into the, some of their vessels and testing them. Yeah. They're getting into it, but um, but actually running centers and things like that's not normal for uh, a maritime academy. So, however, our industry has an extreme need for somebody to be leading certain efforts. Oh, yeah. And, now with the new yeah, and the emission effort, the emission effort is just um, you know it's a it's a very onerous. There, I, was, I was talking to Gene earlier. There, there are going to be a lot of companies, especially smaller tug companies uh, in the Midwest, for example, that will go out of business within the next five to ten years, simply because of the because, yeah. Yeah. because the cost of retooling. If you ask a lot of these companies about why don't you just put a new engine in, and they say, "Well, that's I need to build a new vessel." It's basically scrap the vessel because the engine is so integral to the vessel. They might as well just build it. So, so in a way, the fact that they were exempted from a lot of these regulations over the last yeah, decade, it's kind of, it's kind of hurt them. It's hurt them. Yeah, they're not ready. Yeah. And so, for somebody like me, it's an opportunity because you know they need somebody to help uh, sort out what's going to work. And and all the and some of you involved with it. I mean, all the focus has been on exhaust treatment for emissions. Right. And. And all the stuff we're doing is focusing more on the intake side, the mm -hmm. fuel side, and see if we can do things there. And you're, we're seeing a shift, and there's more and more research in that area now, because the exhaust side has got so many problems, um, you know, and the, and the, and the operators really don't like it. You know, it it's a big cost, big maintenance uh, headache. So, yes. so uh, LNG LNG is the biggest, yeah. um, but LNG requires a complete new ship. If they say that they can retrofit it, it really, as far as I can see now, not really true. Well, that's big, yeah. Automotive, yeah. Areas too. And um, and that may come on, but that won't. That's a twenty-year time scale to yeah. that to happen. So we're at time. Any remaining questions? We're going to have an opportunity. Are you going to update so you your brain? <laughs> Likewise. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Carson, thank you very much for you and Michelle recording this with us from Clean Cities, and thank you all for coming on a beautiful Friday. What's Clean Cities? It is a DOE oh, program. Really? Oh, okay. Promotes use of alternative fuels. So Vermont is unique in that our Clean Cities is a statewide endeavor. Oh, okay. So most of them are like New York City's Clean Cities. So. Well, New England must have trouble, right? Except for like Massachusetts and Southern. 
our cities are small, right? I'm glad I remember the history from other lives. But most important, thank you to you for oh, thanks. coming. Well, thank you for inviting me. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Wonderful.